victim is the wrong word, Ellie, mm -hmm. in, in a way, I, I, I sort of think. Um, this has all come to an end now, and the person involved in this has, has, has ended up in court. But what has it been like for you? What, what actually do you go through when you know this is all happening? I think I had quite a, a brave face on when it first started. So it, it first started here at work. So the gentleman in question was a, a guest on a programme via Zoom. Then that led to us being connected on Twitter. He then started messaging me and it just started, thanks for having me. I said, you're, you're welcome, you were great. Just standard, yeah. standard thank yous, just polite chat. Um, and then it escalated quite quickly into, I love you, you motivate me beyond words, oh. you're so special, you're and so at that precious. Point, were you able to put him off or did you, you must have said things to him that said no. Yes. So, yeah, so, I mean, firstly, Anne, it's a bit funny, I think as, as women we would tend to, you just ignore it because you mm. think it's going to go away and there is an element as a female reporter, I think you just kind of, ex it comes with the territory and you are going to get some, some creepy messages. So I just ignored it to start with and then after about, I'd say six or seven of these messages in a row, I just said, look, this needs to stop. It's making me really uncomfortable and this is so inappropriate. Stop. And then that's when it continued. And what I didn't realise was, until I later spoke to the police, was that was harassment at that point. I didn't even realise I was being harassed at that point. But if you tell someone to stop and they continue with that behaviour that you've asked them to stop, that is harassment. So I didn't even realise that. Um, and then after that, I ended up blocking him on all forms of social media because the, the messages were getting completely out of hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he started sending flowers to the workplace. He showed up here in the office. Um, and yes, he actually got in at one point. He actually he did get in. Office. He managed to, to name some people here, um, obviously done his homework, um, and he was allowed in. Um, he was then taken out. Um, but he did get in this close to me, and that's, what, that's the impact. Mm -hmm. It's You don't know what that person wants with you. Do they want... A photograph? Do they want a hug? Do they want a hello? Or is it something more sinister? And that's what that's what was going on underneath the surface. And I was putting on this brave face, but actually, I was really quite scared. And I think I've only really realised that taking it to court. Yeah. Did you speak in court? I did. I chose to. Yeah. Um, you chose to. And what 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 did you message did you want to get over to them? I, th I feel like I... So I had a choice whether to speak in court and the police were... The officer that worked with me and the police had been fabulous with me. Um, they gave me a choice whether I wanted to speak or not and it was perhaps the easiest option not to. But when um, the last incident that I had with my stalker was at Windsor, which Stephen saw me afterwards... Uh, now you see that at the Queen's funeral. It was at the Queen's funeral. Now you see, that really surprised because you were out in the crowds mm. doing sort of two ways, as we call them, for us, and then obviously nothing... It all stopped happening. <laughs> It all stopped happening, and you turned back up at, at our position. I've got to be honest, I've never seen anyone so upset. I mean, you, you weren't just upset, you were absolutely shaken to the mm. core. I mean, that, it Why? was what really did, distressing to see. So, um, it, so this has been going on at this point for over a year. Um, and oh, my goodness, I didn't know it was that long. Yeah, 16 months in total. Um, and it was the Queen's funeral. And you know, for us as journalists, that means so much to us. And I love Her Majesty and I wanted to do a really good job. And for this channel, I wanted to do a really good job. I've been working hard all morning and... As you do in this job, the first question is always, Ellie, where are you this morning? And I said where I was. And it later transpired that he must have followed me from that position that I so publicly reported. And I headed down to the Long Walk in Windsor. 250,000 people were there, by the way, a quarter of a million people. Um, and I looked up and there he was, like not even 10 feet away from my face. And he had his hands in his pocket. He'd obviously been there a while. Hands in his pockets staring at me and just smiling with the most sinister smile. It was like he was enjoying watching me mm. being so uncomfortable. I was by myself. I'd walked away from my cameraman, so that was my, <laughs> that was my fault. Um, and I just, I just went into a panic attack. Luckily, it was the Queen's funeral. I managed to run to an officer. I don't know where that strength came from, but I just ran to the nearest police officer. And I could still see him in my eyesight. I could still see where he was, and I could not get out my words. I was just having a panic attack. Um, and he, he, got, he got away, uh, but later was arrested for, for what happened. Um, he was held in a, a, a cell overnight. He pled guilty, which is also very good. Um, and then I was given the choice to, to speak in court. And I chose to because I felt like I let myself down that day because I should have said something or done something. 
but I felt like I had, so I wanted him to hear what that day had done to me. Was it open court or were you behind a curtain? I was behind a curtain. I, wanted, yeah. I, I wasn't brave enough to do it without a curtain. Blame you. Um, and I, I think I feel like he, that's something he would have wanted to have seen mm -hmm. me or be close to me or something like that. So I didn't want him to have that, but I did want him to hear what had done to me. So that's what I decided to do, and I just, I just jotted down so, some notes. Um, and I spoke about, you know, the paranoia, and after that, that particular incident... I could see him everywhere just because you're so mm. yes. paranoid. Yes. And there were incidents. I was walking home from, from home one day. I don't even think I was working. Walking home from the station one day, I don't think I was even working. And if my flat was left, I turned right because I was almost certain that the man walking behind me was this person. Mm. And I hid in my neighbour's driveway just to protect myself from this man. It wasn't even him. The man walked past it with somebody else. But that's but where it's it gets to every corner you. of your life, isn't yes. it? It's, it's, it impacts all of your life. It's been described to me as like living with an illness. So it's always there, not serious illness, but a cold. You know, like the symptoms are always there. Always there. It's, 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 it's almost a part of you and you're so used to it and being on edge and looking around and, and feeling nervous if people approach you. I mean, I get approached a lot on the, on the streets with yeah. my job and people are tapping you on the back, hi, Ellie, and you're just so paranoid about who this person could be or what they want with you. Mm. Um, so I really hope this conviction, and I am one of the lucky ones, I also want to say that, my case could be a lot worse. But I'll tell you what's interesting, because you, you, put, you, you put like a sort of statement online last night mm. about, about the case and what had happened. The responses you got from people who've been in similar situations. It's terrifying. Um, I have never really spoken about what happened to me. You saw it, mm. um, but I wasn't making it public knowledge. No, I didn't know anything about it no, at the time. Nobody did, really. Not even my family. I mean, I've intentionally not really told my family anything because I wanted to protect them. Only a very close circle of people knew. Um, I didn't know it was going to be in the Daily Mail yesterday. That was something that was told to me the night before. Oh. Um, so um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing now because of the reaction, and it has thankfully been so supportive and kind but I was worried about how that would be perceived by people um, but I think it is really important to talk about because the amount of people I've spoken to people my friends my person who does my eyebrows my hairdresser like friends from my old workplace have all said oh I've had a stalk for five years ten years 15 years and that it's not spoken about it just mm. seems to be so commonplace but People think if they go to the police, they're not going to be taken seriously. Well, I think that the police attitude has moved on um, because when I was your age, years, years and years ago, the um, uh, it, it, same sort of thing happened to me. Oh, and uh, when I went to the police, they said, well, we can't do anything until he does something. I oh, hope right. that that attitude yeah. is much, much different now. It, um, well, first of all, I'm really sorry that that, that happened to you because I know the impacts that it has mm. on people. But yes, I have been very, very lucky. And I feel guilty for saying that now when I hear the messages from people who've been suffering well, You must years. never feel guilty. But I felt guilty that I was treated so well, but I hope that's a sign that the police have moved on so well. I, I mm. hope so. And I almost accidentally reported my crime. <laughs> so I just said uh, it was actually a loved one who reported it on my behalf because I didn't realise it Can was... you relax now at all or are you still... No. Uh, no, no, I think it does change while, you. It? Yeah, I think it does change you. I hope I can. Um, but even today, I mean, this is the impact that it has on you. Even today, I pulled up in the car and I kind of looked both sides before getting out because I was concerned that he might mm. be there. He wouldn't be, be very silly to be there now with a well, five-year restraining order. Off. But, yeah. Um, yeah, you're on edge. Mm. You're on edge constantly. But, um, yeah, only 5% of cases get conviction. So although the police officers were great with me, and I was very lucky that so much of mine was initially based on social media, whereas black and white, there's so much evidence, the stack of evidence against him was incredible mm -hmm. so that's perhaps why it was easier for me to get conviction but only five percent of people do and there are women who are actually in houses with their stalkers with their perpetrators who have got no escape from from ex-partners who just won't let them go so you know it can be so dangerous and that's what you were talking about just before we came on air mm -hmm. that there are really dangerous and dark elements of, of stalking and although it could start with something as simple as a message it does often it tends to I think escalate. it shows up something very dodgy about the character of somebody who becomes so obsessed that they they behave in that way. Mm, mm. It's but it's not, not normal. It's not, it's not no. normal. It's not normal. No, no, it isn't. No, no. And that's what's but behavior. we shouldn't normalise it. Why do no. we normalise it then? It's just like, oh, they're a bit odd. And we just allow it to, to continue and then we allow it to escalate. And mm. I was frustrated with myself that I let it go on for 12 months, 13 months before that incident at Windsor where, as Stephen described, I was a shell of myself, really. Um, I've never seen anything like it. 
I've mm. never seen anybody so shaken. Mm. And I wonder now that you've had a conviction, and now that you are talking... I mean, I know you were sort of ended up reluctantly in the mail, mm. just the way these... You know, these things happen, works. yeah. Um, but can you, can you gain some strength from the fact that you're now actually able to say, look, I'm a strong woman, I've got through this, and, you know, this, and to other people who are going through this, they can look at it and say, well, actually, you know, there are things I can do, the yeah. police will listen... Yeah, um, definitely. I feel so proud now that I've done it. Now I'm on the other side, and yeah. it did take a lot. And on, on Thursday, when I was heading to court, I was like, why have I done this? Love it. Um, and it was awful. But coming out of there, it was such a cathartic experience to talk about what happened to me and for people to listen. And the, the magistrates that listened to me were so... Did they say anything? Um, they asked how long my restraining order should be. Um, and initially, they said it wouldn't... It shouldn't be very long, a year or something. But this has been going on for 18 months. Uh, so we need a little bit longer than that. Um, and my lawyer then pushed for five years. And for me, I'm delighted with that. I, I can rest safe for, for five years. Um, so that's that's really, really good. Um, but no, I, I, for me, I definitely wanted to, to take it to court. And I would say, if there's anybody watching and listening and, and you're going through something similar, go to the police, show them what's happened or tell them what's happened, and they will take you seriously. Mm. And hopefully you too can get a conviction. But the more people that report it, the more likely it is to be taken seriously. There was a super complaint yesterday um, that was put forward by... Yes, who was saying that there just needs to be um, a set way of police forces in this country dealing with stalking, Mm. because that's the issue. So There's so much disparity as to where you are in the country and what officer you get. My, the police with me were brilliant, the Met Police, but there's other people that don't experience the same. So I really hope something is done with this. This and it's and it's something that's nothing just to do with your job or the fact that you're famous. This is happening all over the country to women and in some cases men too, mm. who are just in you know just ordinary folk. Um, and you would never know about it. You would never hear about it. But it's common. Really common, and I'm so glad you said that because that is a really common misunderstanding that it is someone with a profile or someone who's Mm. on telly or radio. It's not at all. It can be anybody. I mean, the messages I have had from men and women telling me that they've been stalked, they've been harassed for years. It doesn't matter who you are. It could be anybody, and we just shouldn't normalise that behaviour or think if we ignore it, it will go away. Mm. As we were saying, if someone is messaging you, you tell them to stop, they continue, or they come to your house, you tell them to stop and they continue, that is harassment and you can go to the police and an action can be taken yeah Yeah. oh ellie do you know it breaks my heart because you are as people will know you are a bubbly ball of fun (laughs) and and you don't deserve that you You don't don't. deserve it and and even talking about it Mm. you can tell that you you know oh yeah i feel i love you too